Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks, Global Patties. You know, everybody, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today, and while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping Your First Three Years, our quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining us. We have a fun interview all set for you this afternoon with Bridget Mendelson, uh, Bridget Mendel and Becky Masterman of the University of Minnesota Bee Squad. But more on that in a mo- moment. Hey, Kim, how you doing? I'm doing okay. It's um, a friend of mine in Minnesota is 50 below today. I'm only at 25 above zero. So it's uh, com- comparatively speaking, it's a balmy here, but I'm tired uh. of winter. Yeah, I'm ready for springtime for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, when we were talking to Marla a while back, she mentioned the Bee Squad and, and uh, yeah. steered us in that direction. And uh, I tell you, it was, a, it was a good idea to talk to those people. It's amazing the amount of information and, and, and vetted information that they have on their website that would be valuable for all beekeepers, not just for the, uni- uh, the beekeepers of Minnesota, but all around the world. Yep, they're they're uh, they are all over the place, and and you know you mentioned the videos, uh, boy, I, have you watched any of those? They are re- they've really done them well. They did a nice job. Yep, yep. I, you know that's the first video. Not not that I've gone searching, but that's the first video I've seen that shows you how to do a bee beard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pass on that one. Hey Kim, there's a lot of information, or actually a lot of back and forth out on the internet uh, about the Chinese tallow uh, with uh, the Chinese tallow issue. Actually, it's more the internet. The government's involved in this one. APHIS wants to introduce uh, some kind of bug that will eat Chinese tallow. And if you know anything about living down south, Chinese tallow is your bread and butter crop. And hmm. take that away, and you're going to trouble. So we got Steve Coy to come in and t- talk about it. He's with the American Honey Producers, and and he makes a lot of tallow honey. So uh, he's got a vested interest in making this not work. And uh, we'll be interviewing him this coming week, and we'll be out on a podcast a couple weeks after that, yep. I believe. Yep. And there's a deadline on there, so pay attention to the deadline. And um, if nothing else, uh, check out the American Honey Producers webpage. They got a lot of information on there, um, things you can you can write, sign, and t- you know send to your congressman. Good, and we'll have a link to the American Honey Producers Association on on in our show notes. And also, WAS has another mini conference coming up this month at the end of February, February twenty fourth, seven p.m. Mountain Time on. Bee gut microbiome. So, if you really want to get into the ins and outs of the microbiome of a honeybee, this would be a good conference to join. Yeah, Jerry's doing a good job out there, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to listening in. Yeah, I heard that he got wrangled into being president for another two years. Yeah, for he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's making the most of it, though. That's good. Well, he's a good man for it. So, how? Tell me about uh, honeybee obscure, Kim. Well, Jim and I have been working on there. Uh, pretty regular. We've got uh, we've got one that just came out uh, a couple of days ago, and we've got two more lined up to come out. One next week is going to be on uh, packages and nukes. 
This is the time of year people are talking about yeah. getting them, and and uh, what what do you get? A package? You get a nuke? Both? What's best and why, or what's not good and why? And and uh, we kind of wrestle the whole subject to the ground. The one we just finished is on high finishes. I'm sorry to tell you that most of my boxes are sitting out there without any finish on them at all. <laughs> They're just a nice weathered gray. But uh, there's a lot of things you can do, and we kind of we kind of look at all sides of it. Well, you guys do a real good job. I enjoy listening to them. They're they're short, uh, ten minute, twenty minute deep dives into a single topic, and it's fun listening to you both talk. I I get kind of I get caught up listening. It's good. <laughs> well, Jim and I have been talking for nearly thirty years, so it uh, c- comes kind of easy. <laughs> That's good. It sounds sounds like it. And you have a brand new website all set up uh, for Honeybee Obscure. It's that's in our show notes. Uh, www.honeybeeobscure.com. Speaking of new websites, we have our new website up and ready, uh, beekeepingtodaypodcast.com, and gives you the ability to, to leave direct comments on our website, uh, leave vi- voice comments uh, for us. We get a little voicemail. Sign up for our, our newsletter that we'll be kicking out uh, on a regular basis coming up soon and uh, with any announcements. So ch- check out our brand new website. And the other podcast we're working on is the 2 million blossoms podcast and that's with our guest co-host kirsten trainer that focuses on a broader topic of pollinators so not just honeybees but all the pollinators such as their magazine follows and you said you've heard from kirsten in the last week or so well she's uh she moved to, she's taken a job in germany at the university over wow. there or an institute over there and um she's just getting settled in so she's been she's been busy moving and not talking so much but uh she'll get back to talking <laughs> to us pretty soon so, Kim, we have Bridget and Becky today on the podcast. Yeah, Marla started something good up there, her and Gary Ruder, when uh, she says about 10 years ago now, I guess. And um, it started out with just a couple of volunteers, and now they got a dozen people, and they're all over the, all over the planet getting things done. All right. Well, that'll be fun, and we'll get to that right away. But first, we have an audio postcard from Liz at Broodminder, and then we'll drop into a, a quick spot from our friends at Strong Microbial, and then we'll get right into our interview. Hey, this is Liz from Broodminder, and we are a small company that builds hive monitoring devices that measure temperature, humidity, and weight data. So over the past six years, we've been collecting data from our citizen scientists from all over the world and testing our devices and software on our own beehives. And so we've developed some product improvements that we want to roll out over the next uh, few months. And I wanted to share those with you. I I hope that they will simplify things and um, just you know, make things easier for my fellow beekeeper brethren out there. So first off, we have a a new sub hub device, which is basically a small device that lives in your apiary and it can collect up to 50 different broodminder devices at once and then transmit that data from over a thousand feet away. So basically you can upload your data from the comfort of your own home and check in on your bees while you're watching a football game, for example. So pretty nifty. Um, It makes things easier and and faster, of course. Um, Second, we have a DIY weight scale. So for all the folks that like to build things and fiddle around, uh, you can take our electronic devices and software that we've built and apply your own components And you can then upload your data to mybroodminder.com, which is just like how our other products work. Um, So you can just uh, add your configuration seamlessly into into our website. And then lastly, we have a new mobile app that we'll be rolling out. My colleagues Amanda and Lorenzo have been working really hard on this. Um, It should be a bit more sophisticated and user-friendly. It'll have some nice new features like foreign language support, and high-speed data transfers. So I'm super excited to see that rolling out. So if you'd like to stay up to date on our new products and just hear from us, we send out a monthly newsletter. You can sign up at broodminder.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram where I document my own journey on beekeeping with the latest hive technology. 
Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbial's Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. All right. Hey, we're all back. And, and with us now, we have Bridget Mendel and Becky Masterman from the Bee Squad at University of Minnesota. Welcome, ladies, to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, you bet. You, you, Marla got our... Um, uh, got us curious when we were talking to her a while ago about your program and and I'm glad you guys could make it today to tell us a lot more about it and what I'm hoping to see too, just two things one just to explain what you do and how you manage to get it done but uh, people listening might want to be able to pick up some aspects of your program and do it where they are and and if you explain how that happens they can take advantage of that I know you got a ton of stuff on your webpage uh, on on how you do what you do and, and all of the things that you do, but if somebody wanted to emulate what you're doing, so kind of keep that in mind, all right? So Jeff, did you take a look at this web page? Yes, I'm impressed by the 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 programs that are being offered and uh, and the depth of them. Um, so can you talk about the B Squad? How did you? What is the B Squad for our listeners who don't know anything about it? Well, I can talk about what the B-Squad is, and then maybe Becky can talk about how the B-Squad came to be. Okay. Uh, Becky? <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> so I currently direct the B-Squad, and I took over from Becky a, about a year ago, um, and she ran it um, for many years before that. Um, so the B-Squad is based at the University of Minnesota B-Lab. We're part of the lab. And we're really the outreach arm of the lab. So our primary job is to help people help bees. We help beekeepers um, to keep their bees healthy in the context of the Twin Cities, which is very particular. Beekeeping is very popular, um, which has its own um, uh, challenges. So we, we have very um, specific management um, support for those beekeepers in urban areas in our in our cities. Um, we help bee lovers to help bees in all different ways, depending on their capacities, whether it's um, supporting research, planting for bees, advocating for diverse pollinators. Um, we share uh, science from and we sort of translate it to a public audience. We also help people who don't like bees not hurt bees. So we share a lot of information about unpopular pollinators like, you know, wasps and how not to use pesticides if not necessary, things like that. So we have lots of programs. We're really sort of open and creative about how we're reaching people. And the other thing we don't usually talk about, but I was just thinking about, is we also help the lab. So a big part of our work is actually internally supporting the research that goes on, whether we're actually collecting data, helping uh, Marla and her team of um, students and researchers, um, supporting uh, Dr. Elaine Evans in the Native Bee Lab as she's developing outreach um, for her programming. Um, we work with everybody as kind of as needed. So we're kind of um, flexible in that way as well. It sounds like an extension program on steroids. Yes. <laughs> Having been in extension a long time ago and spent some years there, I'm envious of the resources you managed to, to uh, harness and to make your program work. So, B Becky, you were going to talk about how you got started. Sure. The B Squad was Marla Spivak's idea. And in 2011, she put together 
a couple of uh, beekeepers and that had worked in the lab and, and started running a couple of programs that would specifically support either beekeepers or have um, allow the public to manage or to host bees, basically, pay the bee squad to manage bees in their backyard. And so those two very broad programs, one, let's help beekeepers and, and do some hands-on training, and two, let's have people who don't have bees have the capacity to own bees, but let Bee Squad manage them. That's how it started. And then it became really clear when I was hired, uh, I was asked to help make it sustainable, um, but that it became clear that we had to have focus to some of our programs. And also that it wasn't just about help having uh, people keep bees in their backyard, but it was bringing our services to the broader community. We started connecting with artists. We started connecting with veterans. We started connecting with children and, and just people who were gardeners. And so it became this, this big extension program within the Bee Lab where we were working to connect all the pieces and bring information or services to those groups that needed it the most. And uh, the, the best thing about Bee Squad along the way when I was hired, uh, at that point, there were two, one person working full time and a couple people working part time. And throughout the years, we brought it up to several full time members. And the best part of it is that it's a mixture of scientists and artists and people who have degrees in theater, people who have degrees in uh, English, people who have uh, varied backgrounds. And that makes us really reflect the community. And I can go on for the next 45 minutes, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when did the B-Squad start? It, it was 2011 that Marla had the idea, and I was hired in 2012. All right. And so it started at just a couple of, of programs. And and it's uh, you mentioned that uh, people might want to learn how to do some of these programs on their own. And, and really what it, we found is that um, two things. One, it's really expensive to go and manage bees for people and to do hands-on training. And so we had to figure out how to make that work. And then we found that you sh we didn't think that we should be managing a lot of bees in a large area without asking some questions. Questions. And we were seeing bee health trends almost immediately as far as how well bees were doing or how bees were impacted by pests and diseases. And so we, we really started to focus. It was uh, during quite the crisis time as far as Varroa were concerned. And so we really saw Varroa and the associated viruses impact our the colonies we were managing. But it became very important to us that we wouldn't just manage bees and produce lots of honey for people without having another reason why we were doing it. And that's where some of the science, some of the, the mite management came, comes into play. I would add to that. I think, you know, the research, the strength that we have is that we're working with the lab um, very closely. So we have that the resources of the lab and the science coming out of the lab, um, including the native bee lab and the honey bee lab. Um, and so that's our, our real strength. And that seems like an essential part too, that we're sort of always reflecting the science and updating our approach based on what um, the researchers are telling us. And the second thing is that some of our programs are much broader than just us. For example, Bee Veterans is, um, we are a, kind of a smaller program amongst many. And we're right now um, beginning of an official collaboration with MSU's Heroes to Hives um, program, which offers a national um, training for veterans. And we're sort of um, supporting their expansion so that other groups specifically associated with universities can um, start their own chapters. That, you know, and we also work with um, Be Informed Partnership uh, with their Sentinel Apiary program, which is another place where, you know, if you're a beekeeper who want to con contribute to a larger project or do some, you know, community or citizen science in your area, that's another program that's already national that we're kind of tapping into. Well, that leads to the question. Uh, you've got a, a, a boatload of programs that you guys operate, you know, planting seeds and, and mite check kits and, and all of those things. How do you fund all of this? <laughs> that is a good question. We work really, really hard. Um, so a lot, um, so our, our, 
um, B Network program. That's the program where we're working with homeowners and corporations, sort of, um, I you know, symbiotically, so that we're managing bees for them. We're providing them with education, and they're, you know, funneling funds back into our programs that we're able to do that. That's one part of it, and we and people don't know this because we're at the university, but the most of us are funded through um, grants and donations. So a lot of times we're writing grants, we're doing you know, small fundraising efforts, you know, for example, we're, we're, you know, we'll do anything to get people interested in bees. So we're saying, you know, okay, the rusty patch, it's our new state bee. How can we create more interest? So we're going to do like a little mini campaign, get people really excited. What communities have we not reached that we want to reach? And we'll just do our own fundraising or look for funding with, within the university or without, um, look for community partners to be able to do essentially, you know, extension that we're just kind of doing ourselves. We also um, obviously work with um, Dr. Katie Lee in extension and Elaine in extension as well. And I see on your webpage, you you talk about the classes, community classes that you give, and you've got a room full of people. So I imagine there's some some, uh, cost to the people attending your classes. That helps? Yes. So uh, we have our mentoring apiary program, which is... um, very affordable for beekeepers to come and kind of, you know, have either a season long um, series that they can follow, uh, you know, some teaching hives along with us throughout the season for beginners or more advanced beekeepers, or we have a clinic model where you can jump in for, I think it's $25 a class. So yeah, there is a cost to that, especially when there's not a pandemic, we really enjoy giving talks to groups, um, gardening groups, groups, you know, churches, all kinds of people who want to either get better beekeeping skills or get um, more information about helping bees. Um, we we love giving um, talks to those groups. And we, we often ask for, um, you know, like an honorarium so that we can um, sustain that work. Okay. One one of the things that I saw on your on your webpage was a whole series of of kind of short videos. Uh, tell us about all of those videos. I mean, there's what twenty or something. There's a there's a whole lot of them that you guys have put together. Some of those are done by um, Gary Gary Ruder, who actually just retired from the Bee Lab. Um, he he started. I remember I held that darn umbrella in the hiving in sleet and rain. It was. Cold cold it was cold um and um then they were um they were just magically put to polka music so beekeeping and polka music work really really well together i know the bee lab just redid the beekeeping in northern climates class and so uh right now it's uh, online and i believe there are several videos that go within that class also and i don't know that they've been put public yet bridget might know that but um but we do we do use video, uh, maybe not as much as we could, but um, th- those videos are very very well done and they're timeless. The you know how to hive a package, how to you know how to add the second deep. Those things are are free and available on the, the website. Uh, on the website, and um, you just mentioned that uh, you have a uh, uh, YouTube channel. Also, are they out there too? Yeah. So I. To talk to or speak to all the videos because I do think we sort of use that medium for different things. For example, one of the big projects we're doing right now is we're um, it's part of a program called Pollinator Ambassadors, and that is originally a program that focuses on training youth to be able to talk about bees. And actually, the reason this came about originally was because we get so many requests for speakers, especially with, you know, student groups and um, different audiences that we just can't even accommodate. So we thought, why not train more people? But then, you know, it sort of led to, you know, a more uh, nuanced reasoning, including, you know, we're empowering the next generation of scientists, we're exposing them to research and to the actual physical lab and um, trying to, you um, support young people in being in the field of environmental activism or research or whatever. Um, there, a big component of the program right now is these toolkits that are being made again, so that, you know, you, if you are a, an educator that works at, 
like a um, community center or like, you know, some sort of place where you'll be reaching an audience and you want to talk about bees, this kit helps you talk about them. So there's all these components and games and, you know, ways that you can interact with whatever your audience is. And a lot of those we've made how to videos and supplemental materials for those. So we have certain times where video is helpful. Definitely. I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. And, and it makes you 10 times bigger than you really are because you get your information out into the community and you don't have to be there. <laughs> That's a smart idea. Um, the, the other thing I was looking at, you've got this plant seeds program. What's that? So we have this great relationship um, early on when I was teaching in the mentoring apiary. Farmer Keith rode up in his motorcycle and he was a corn and soybean farmer who had just purchased eight colonies of bees and he needed to learn beekeeping. And uh, our plant seeds program really came from that initial relationship with Keith, who is 150% behind pollinator habitat. And as we were talking about healthy bees and how do we um, how do we make sure our our bees are getting enough food, it became really clear that just a program, an umbrella program where we could put different events and different initiatives under the plant seeds for bees uh, was very important. And so we've had a um, we received a grant a few years ago where we had a lovely field day where we brought together farmers and beekeepers and scientists and land owners and we. We worked with Pete Berthelsen and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, and we talked about diff getting different kinds of food in the ground for bees, um, as well as some of Farmer Keith's ideas as far as um, different crops. And so, so it came under that program, and it, it turns out that it's it's so important. And I'll say that um, Bridget and I also write for Bee Culture, and we just in this issue this month, so uh, February, I guess it, it's in February. Uh, our our article called um, meal planning just came out, and it's it's we're trying to get beekeepers to think very differently about keeping bees. And what if your bees really just depended upon the flowers that you could put into the ground? And we know your bees are flying far, but but it really is so important, and it re reflects that plant seeds for bees. It's so important that we think big when it comes to feeding our, our bees. And it's not just our honeybees, it's all the other bees out there. That was my soapbox, everybody. <laughs> well, it's a good one to be on, for sure. Um, so so you've got, you, you're, you're expanding this, uh, you're at the University of Minnesota, St. Paul, Minneapolis, but are you outside of those boundaries too? We have friends all over the place. <laughs> yeah. We, Go ahead, I mean, Rich. I think, I mean, I was thinking about this when we were talking about videos. We are always really careful when we are talking to beekeepers about management that we remain sort of specific to our um, northern zone. And then e even more specifically, you know, we're working with not exclusively, but a lot of the beekeepers uh, we work with are in the metro area. And so we recommend things based on you know, where we are specifically. And we tend to, um, um, we don't want it to sort of, you know, there's so much information out there and we, we think it's so important to for people to have like local mentors um, who understand the region and understand the climate and understand the um, geography in terms of what other bees are, um, what other native bees are out there that you want to be thinking about and also what's the honeybee um, setup. But that said, we we do like um, we do like working with other groups. So we are going to be talking to the St. Louis beekeepers um, very soon, and we're very excited about that. And we're able to sort of um, um, advocate local mentors while still sharing what we think is important to share. We our my check program where we have a map on the um, Be Informed Partnership site. That was a collaboration with uh, it was uh, our B Squad along with Michigan State Megan Milbreath at Michigan State, Dennis Van Engelsdorp at 
uh, University of Maryland. And so we've done uh, some national collaborations and um, those relationships are really important. And that's why that's why we tell beekeepers go to when you can go to those conventions because you get together. And, and as Bridget said, we have a lot of really local problems, but you also have the ability when you talk to people from different areas to get a handle on some of the the big picture of these problems and so we really have taken advantage of that yeah and our mite kits themselves which is funny because we always tell people that they're super easy to just assemble a mite kit um, so that you can test your bees and um, monitor their mites and uh, start to learn about how mite populations work and when they spike and how you're going to manage. Um, but people love that we have a really easy, inexpensive way where you can just watch the video, you could read the thing, and then you just can um, have all those components together. And that we get requests from all over the country for, for shipment. So that's hmm. a fun way to connect with groups as well. <laughs> Well, and, and that's a surprise too. We've sold, I mean, I don't know what the tally is this year, but we've sold over 4,000 mite, mite kits wow. and it's not just to Minnesotans. And um, and beekeepers love to save money, but a lot of them are willing to pay for our mite kits and that supports our, our work also. <laughs> I feel like that was a commercial that wasn't on purpose. You really can make them yourself for even less. <laughs> you really can, yes. <laughs> so what is your mite kit? What's it consist of? It's based on the University of Nebraska, Mary and Ellis's work. And so it's a, it's a, the, and actually um, farmer Keith sourced the, the kit components out years ago for us where we have a, a white a rectangular bucket. So everything can fit into this bucket and you can also shape it's a, it's based on the powdered sugar roll. And so it has a, um, it's a plastic shaking jar so that you, you don't, it won't break and a scoop where you can measure your bees and um, a bottle to hold water to clear the water once you shake the powdered sugar through and the mites through the screen. And, um, I, and I think still powdered sugar, we send it with powdered sugar. So it's, um, it's pretty simple, simple stuff, but it is convenient. It's, and it's kind of funny because if you look at the ones we sell versus the ones we use, the ones we use are, are beaten up, but they still work. So <laughs> they're pretty hardy. So I was looking at your your programs that you have online, and and you you designate them as northern climate classes for beekeeping. What would be in that course for a different area if I'm not from a northern climate? That's a great question. Um, so Katie Lee has led the effort to revamp our northern climates course and put it online, and this was uh, became especially important um, because of COVID. We were not able to meet in a large auditorium. So it's been a big process. And I would say while, you know, we have a specific system that we recommend that really, really works, especially for new beekeepers who, you know, you want to see how it works before you, you know, go off on your own and experiment. Um, but the thing that is relevant to anyone is that we, it's very, very biology focused. So a big part of the philosophy is that if you understand the biology of the bees, you're going to be a better beekeeper. Um, and, you know, Marla has a way of describing it as, um, you know, basically following the bees lead. And what that means is sort of, you know, understanding that they're this very, they've been around a lot longer than us. They have it figured out. They know what they're doing. And if you understand that biology, how the super organism works, um, how they naturally reproduce, what is the queen? What, why is she, what is her role in the colony? you know, what, what is a queen issue really, um, from a biology perspective. Um, and then also with, uh, pests. So if you're understanding the mite cycle and you're understanding their biology, you're going to be a better beekeeper and you're going to be able to know when to intervene and when not to intervene. So that's, I think, relevant to anyone because anyone, at least in this, this country we're working with, with the same animals. So, so you're talking more about the why of doing something and not just how. Exactly. So it's a mixture of, you know, demos, you know, from how to set up your, your, you know, your Langstroth hive, you know, we recommend this much. And for our Northern climates, we have, you know, a recommendation for how much honey you need to get through the winter. That might not be relevant mm -hmm. to you here in Arizona, but, um, I'll, the, the, the why is, is going to be relevant. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very good. 
And I noticed also on the website, something I hadn't noticed in any other uh, uh, online, or not online, but any of the, the courses. So you have your mentoring apiary and you have your, your class apiaries. Is the requirement and the statement that um, that the teaching apiaries are, are students must be gloveless. So do you receive much resistance from new students and how do you help a timid uh, first year beekeeper, second year or fifth year, 10th year, someone who's not happy with getting stung in the fingers or getting used, used to working with bees with their gloveless hands? How do you get them over that concern? Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> oh, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. Uh, I'm a really fun beekeeping instructor. I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, that's, I'll let, I'll let Bridget answer too, but it's really, um, boy, is it important uh, for, for us to train students so they're not afraid of the beads. And if you are wearing gloves because you are afraid of getting stung and that's how you want to spend your entire beekeeping career, Whew, that's a that's a tricky way to do it unless unless you're you know you're literally in an area with Africanized bees and and it's it's not possible um but but it is something that we we it's it's more dangerous for a beekeeper to get stung rarely based upon allergic reactions than to get stung regularly and so it's it's something and, and boy if you're if you are working alone and you're trying not to get stung but you you act, i mean you know that when you get stung it's really because you're taking your suit off you sit on one in the car or in the in the truck you i mean it's it's not you know if you have gentle bees that the or, or you do something wrong and that's another big reason why we we suggest you you don't wear gloves because if, if you're following the bees lead, you're going to be a much better beekeeper than um, going and plowing through it and not, not getting to learn very quickly that the bees are, are upset and you're, you're doing something wrong. I'll, I'll let you give a nicer answer. Well, I think it's an important discussion because it's, it's rarely discussed. I mean, it, it's discussed in side channels or it's made fun of, but there, there is, how does, you know, and I saw that and I thought, well, that's a great question. Because how do you teach someone to get used to doing that? How do you get them comfortable working with bees? And I was just curious as your approach. Well, I mean, for me um, personally, I learned to keep bees without gloves. And one of the things I, I paid attention to was how my mentor moved. And that is how I learned beekeeping. So how he moved in the colony, how he used smoke and literally how his body moved because, you know, and, and it was so obvious that like you sort of, um, you needed to react maybe the opposite to what your instinct would be. So your instinct would be to like, you know, move your hands quickly or be jerky because you're trying to like kind of stay away from these bees. And instead you had to kind of lean into it and just be extra calm. Yes. I am surrounded by 60,000 stinging insects, you know? And so I feel like watching that is a much better skill for safely maneuvering your hives and not getting stung than sort of saying, okay, I'm going to cover myself up. And, you know, we definitely, you know, have beekeepers who will say, oh, I've, I've been a beekeeper for, for a year and I still haven't been stung. And it's sort of like, yeah, as Becky was saying, if that's your goal, um, A, you're, that's just not sustainable. Like you should not be a beekeeper if you don't want to get stung. And then be like, it, you miss out on so much because then once you're in there and you have that way of moving, like our whole philosophy is that we have super gentle bees. Like we are not commercial beekeepers. We don't have Africanized bees. Like we are working with gentle bees. And if we move gently, we're going to notice if we're uh, disturbing them. Okay. They're getting a little riled up. We're going to notice all of these things we're going to notice if we get stung versus not noticing. And then you keep hitting bees, you keep, you know, that pheromone is, alarm pheromone is spreading and you're moving it around. So it's really in, to make, keep the bees at their most gentle and to teach the best technique. I don't know how to teach good technique if I'm wearing, if people are wearing gloves, because I don't even know how to do that. Um, so yeah. I think mo modeling it is important too. And just, you know, seeing someone who's, able to move serenely and how they even react to that sting is, is important. I'm now laughing because I remember someone else who was working with my mentor when I first learned, like he 
got stuck. He, he was being chased by a bee and he ended up getting so hurt because he ran into a post trying to run away from the bee. And it was just like, you know what I mean? You have to model like the opposite of that because it is scary. To people. I'll, I'll add to that too. Uh, one of the reasons why we also do loveless beekeeping is the fact that we, we really think that if you are a beekeeper in a in an urban or a suburban area, and you are keeping your bees around other people and their pets, you need to find out if you have mean bees. Because every once in a while, we get some mean bees. And if you have mean bees, and you didn't notice because you were just always gloved up, then when their population goes from nuke or package all the way up to full-blown colony at the end of the summer, if, if they're mean, you've got a bigger problem to handle than if you figured out pretty early on that they, they were a, a much more defensive. And so we, um, we want to make sure that people are managing bees around other people that, that are gentle. And if, if you are also causing that defensiveness potentially because you don't have gloves, then you are potentially causing a problem for your neighbors or your, your own family members. And so we really, we feel pretty strongly about it. So essentially you become a better beekeeper by not wearing gloves. You bring up a good point also in dealing with your local ordinances and, and city councils and things. When you first started, I mean, you've got a bee lab on campus, so there must have been some acceptance of having bees in the community, but you kind of expanded that a million fold. So how has how has Minneapolis-St. Paul reacted to all of this more bees? That's a different reaction. But, you know, we're very um, particular about our messaging, as you can tell. And, you know, so one of the things we do, not very sort of little to do with honeybees, but we're for example, we use, we always use the word defensive versus aggressive because we feel like that is a nuance that, you know, supports a picture of bees that are def defensive if they're being, uh, if, you know, threatened within their nest and not if they're just out and about um, in their garden. So it's a way to encourage people to see these insects as part of our landscape and not a, a threat. We have, a lot, there's so much support for pollinators in general in our city. So it's mostly about get, getting the messaging right and making sure people are doing the most, um, you know, taking actions that are the most beneficial for bees. So we're often telling people, you know, reminding them that, you know, honeybees actually are not native to this area and that, you know, you, if you get a colony of bees, you're not actually helping the bee population. Again, back to honeybee biology explaining why we can, um, you know, divide bees and create, you know, more colonies and we don't need everybody to become beekeepers. We need you to host uh, bumblebees. We need you to plant for all um, pollinators, those kind of things. So that kind of messaging supports a city that's really like over eager to, to help pollinators for the most part. Um, but for sure, there's some people that are still, um, you know, worried that even if they just see those boxes, they get really concerned or sort of focused on them and whether they might bother, you know, their kids or something like that. So we do a, we do some mediating and basically sharing information so that people um, don't freak out. But also with beekeepers, you know, acknowledging that, you know, you are an ambassador now, you, you have to deal with this. You do have neighbors. You can't just be like, ah, oh, like, you know, people are, you know, crazy. I'm just ignoring them. You do have to find a way, you know, maybe it's giving them honey every year where you can make sure that they feel like a part of it and they feel like you're respecting their, their, their property that your bees, their bees are, you know, using. Oftentimes we see that with our customers, slowly their neighbors, oh, I, you know, we saw the bees, we planted some flowers for them. They, they tend to get into it after a while. Good. Uh, uh, Jeff, I just have one more question and then I, I, I sure I, we certainly need to find out what we've missed but my one the one question i have is b art what are you guys what are you guys doing with b art uh, the funny the funny thing is we've actually been had requests for actual dead bees so somebody could make art but that is not the, the um focus of our program <laughs> but um i will actually I'm, I'm going to let bridget answer this because she she wrote a couple of grants that were funded where we have been able to do um, 
uh, some really neat things. And with the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, she's been continuing with that mm-hmm. too. Yeah, so that definitely is my baby in a way. Um, my background is um, in creative writing. So I'm very much part of the, the art world. And for me, it's a very important lens for um, understanding the world. And I think, um, you know, I actually got into bees because I saw them everywhere in literature. And, you know, everybody writes about bees, so many poems about bees. Um, so that's just, to me, like a really important part of the conversation. So it was a combination of feeling like, you know, I don't even see it as like artists translating science, but artists looking at these kind of complex ecological questions and understanding, you know, our human role. I, I see their their own kind of research or perspective as, as really key as part of the conversation. And a lot of artists are interested in bees because bees are fascinating and everybody's inspired by bees. So we get a lot of people having, you know, with requests, either they want some more language around it. They want more information. They want to collaborate and put objects into our colonies and, you know, do things like that. Um, So, or they're more public artists and they're creating awareness. So we, it's a combination of really valuing that perspective and then um, an interdisciplinary work. So not just thinking through a scientific lens, but thinking, um, cross disciplinarily, and then also just about public interest from from different groups or individuals. So we've done a lot of different things. It's very free flowing. So right now we are um, doing this Rusty Patch project, and we are looking for if anyone's listening to this, we're looking for um, artists who wants to um, work with us on some outreach, maybe some video, maybe some um, visual art. Um, to work on getting um, information about planting for bees into new communities. We're really focused on um, reaching people in like commonly spoken languages in the Twin Cities besides English. So Somali, Hmong, Spanish. Um, and so, yeah, we're that's a project where we're inviting an artist in. And then let's see, we worked with an artist. This is another Rusty Patch project, but we love we love this. this our, it's our state bee, so we, we like talking about the Rusty Patch, but um, we have a new t-shirt design. That's another way we like to, everybody wants a B-Squad t-shirt. So we are we are adding a Rusty Patch um, t-shirt that a local artist named Sarah Nassif designed, and we're selling that in our store. Um, so there's a lot of kind of different ways we interact with artists. Nice. We We also have managed bees for two different art museums in the Twin Cities, as well as an uh, art school. Uh, for over five years now. And so we, um, in non-pandemic times, were brought into those those buildings and we interact with their audiences and we share messaging. And they, of course, have the, the best painted boxes um, <laughs> because they <laughs> have... They, do. <laughs> they, 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 they can go deep as far as their resources are concerned. <laughs> nice. You've gone from mite checks to painted boxes. I think you've covered a lot of ground here, and and it sounds like a pretty remarkable program. I hope I'm hoping people can pick up pieces of this and use it in their communities. You've done a a good job of of establishing a program and then advancing it. I'm pretty impressed. Thank you. I think that one thing I would want to emphasize is I think back to Becky's point um, about. The beekeeping, uh, the beekeeping, beekeepers um, being this um, really important group for advocating for getting food in the ground to for planting. Um, I think right now a lot of people are interested in, um, you know, the the bee the bee question. You know, how do we support native bees? How do we support beekeepers? How do we how do honeybees fit into that picture? And for us, we feel like you know beekeepers are already in love with bees. So this is a group that we are wanting to give the tools to be able to talk about native bees, learn about the bees in their area. That's a place where any beekeeping group can do what we do. They can get information about um, how many bees are in our state. What are the bees that are we find easily? What are the citizen national citizen science programs we can participate in? Um, what are the bees that are endangered or um, that are more rare? And so in the, doing that advocacy, I think 
any any beekeeper has has already the skills and understanding about pollinators to do and and then supporting people in in planting for both their their honeybees and for for the native bees. So yeah, that's something where I feel like you don't have to have a whole university to to start that in your in your area. Yeah, I'll I'll add to that too. Um because we've been talking a lot about backyard beekeeping because that's the the group that we support the most as a bee squad. But we're friends with a lot of commercial beekeepers and the commercial beekeepers, the the I cannot tell you the number of I'm just Two days ago, phone call. How do we get more food in the ground? How do we get more food in the ground for the bees? Um, they're they're one hundred percent passionate about that uh, about feeding bees and and making sure because um, the honey crops have gone down so much and and they understand the big picture. And so one of the things that Bridget and I are are working on right now with the Minnesota honey producers, which is um, it's a lot of commercial beekeepers in the group, but as we've started a habitat committee and um, it's brand new. We, we got it approved at our last board meeting. I'm on the board and, and Bridget is also. And it's something that we, we feel pretty passionate about as far as uh, working with other beekeepers to really have a plan. And a lot of people belong to beekeeping organizations. And I've asked around and I haven't heard of any beekeeping groups that actually have a habitat committee where uh, you can either react to opportunities that the community provides you as far as what can we do to help you. You can say, ABZ, you know, we need, or ABC, we need you to do this, this, and this for the bees. Or um, you can be proactive and you can go and you can talk to your representatives. You can go to the state capitol and you can influence legislation. You can, you can really get some uh, important changes uh, to occur if, if we're a little bit more organized. And so um, I think beekeepers of all levels have that capacity and um, working together just on the question of habitat is just key. And there are lots of good programs out there already, but um, I think we're just, we're just really not taking advantage or, or we don't get how important it is to get our bees fed. Very good. You know, it's been, it's quite a pleasure having you both on Beekeeping Today podcast and, and, and the information and the services you provide is, is phenomenal. I encourage all of our listeners to go out to, uh, to the B squad website, which is in the show notes and look at the wealth of information that's out there. Not only the online classes that we've talked about, but there's manuals, uh, there's, uh, uh, Different information about um, the ordinances, uh, how to test for row mites. Um, there's even if you're if you're even insanely interested, you can learn how to do a bee beard from the very ground up. So it's uh, there's a lot of information mm -hmm. out there, and and it's it's great that you have it there for uh, beekeepers, no matter where you're located. So uh, Bridget Mendel and and Becky Masterman, I we appreciate you being on the show today. Thanks, guys. It was a good time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey, they were really fun to list, talk to, and, and the the programs that they have. This is pretty amazing. They're doing a yeah, good job. Yeah, uh, like I said, uh, uh, when when Marla and Gary started it, they had a vision, and and fortunately, they got out of the way and let these good people take that vision in a lot of different directions. The one that I'm really impressed with is our veterans program. They're working with, uh, over with the people at the university of Michigan and they're not all yeah. just honeybees. They're also looking at working with the rusty patch bumblebees. So they got their fingers in a lot of programs and they're doing a lot of good work. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm always amazed at the amount of information that's available, um, to a beekeeper. If they're looking for just good, solid information about bees, beekeeping, pollinators, um, if you want reliable information, it's out there for you. Yep. I also enjoyed <laughs> Becky's reply. No, I really was amazed. I, I really was so happy to see, uh, the emphasis uh, on working the bees without gloves, Yes, but to see it actually advertise that their students have to work bees without gloves is, is interesting. And it, and Becky's reply was was priceless so I <laughs> probably blew out everyone's speakers laughing but it was it was good yep they're yep. doing a great program up there okay well that about wraps it up for this episode before we go I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show 
Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly up from our website or by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page on our website. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? No, I'm just trying to stay warm here, Jeff. (laughs) I hear you. I hear you. Take care.